Lab Guy here. Let's continue with the episode More Improvements, Part 15 of The Chief, my Indian Head Test Pattern Generator. Today we're going to look at three things. We're going to review the frequency equalization circuit in the video amplifier. We are going to look at the uh, blanking pulse circuit that drives the grid in the monoscope tube and we're going to look at the horizontal deflection driver for the deflection yoke and how I improved the deflection retrace situation there. So without further ado let's get on with it. If you recall in the last video I replaced the peaking control capacitor, CV1, with the small yellow unit, which has a value of 12 to 40 picofarads. Let's look closely at this coupling network going from the video level control into the first video amplifier. Ignoring the capacitor, just imagine it's not there. We have R2 and R3 forming a voltage divider network. That voltage divider divides the incoming voltage, whatever it may be, and reduces it by a factor of 177 times. The voltage across R3 is 1 over 177 of the input voltage. So the following amplifier, U3B, was originally programmed with resistors R4 and R5 to lift that signal back up by 177 times. For this video op amp, that's too much gain. The amplifier becomes unstable at extremely high gain like that. So the proper answer was to reduce the gain of that amplifier and increase the gain of the following amplifier to make up for that. So I took the 177, or in this case 176 and a half, we'll call it 177, and took the square root of it, which is 13.3. So each amplifier will multiply the incoming signal by 13.3 times. This placed uh, both amplifiers within a stable range. They were not unstable anymore. And the previous design was responsible for the flashing black bar in the picture. So each amplifier amplifies by 22.5 dB. You add decibels together to get the 45 decibel compensation for R2, R3 dropping our signal by 45 decibels or 177 times. Now, the purpose of CV1, the capacitor. It is a natural function of the scanning electron beam, the capacitance of the image target in the tube, and the coupling circuit to roll off frequency response. That is to blur high frequency detail. Fine detail is high frequency. So if you recall the original image I got from the tube, it was very grim indeed. It was a very blurry image. The peaking control capacitor acts like a resistor that the higher the frequency going through it, the lower its resistance becomes. What that resistor divider and capacitor does is to re-equalize or flatten the frequency response. Unfortunately, in doing so, we lose a great deal of our signal, which we must then reamplify. To reiterate, the first amplifier raises the signal 13.3 times. Then it's AC coupled across C1, C2, and C3 to U3C, the second amplifier, which amplifies it again 13.3 times. And that makes up our 177 times gain that was required to get our signal back up to our one volt, approximately one volt level. So let's back up a step. 
following pin 10 of U3C down to Q1, which is a field effect transistor being driven by clamp pulses generated on the sync board. Those occur during any time that the tube is blanked off. So that during that time that should be a zero volt line relatively. A relative. It's floating AC wise over the capacitors. So during blanking Q1 is turned on and connects the right side of the capacitors to the voltage coming from the setup control. This voltage is a DC level and it sets the DC on the right hand end of the capacitors. Now the signal coming across will want to float that voltage to some other value but during the time period of one line of video and the size of those capacitors as you can see it's uh, primarily uh, 3200 microfarads C1 and C2 in parallel those are very large capacitors and then the third capacitor 10 microfarad non-polarized NP that is a ceramic capacitor which carries the higher frequencies. The, the two large capacitors uh, don't couple high frequencies very well. So the combination of all of these takes care of the low frequencies and the high frequencies. That's how that works. So the Q1 switch clamps that voltage during blanking to zero volts. So that our black level is zero volts. Coming out of U3C, we go through a T-switch, I call it, uh, R8, R9, and then Q2, which is driven by blanking, composite blanking. Anytime the video is to be blanked off, the node between R8 and R9 is switched directly to ground, killing that signal right there. Then, the next stage may not even be necessary but I put it in that is a a clipper to clip any bit of signal that does manage to go below zero volts and it clips it off so it just literally anything in the video below zero volts needs to be clipped off because it can look like sync to the monitor or to the capture card whatever's downstream so that clips everything in the raw video below zero volts. So video can only go from zero volts up and generally it goes up to about 0.7 volts on average. Then it goes into the last amplifier U3A which is a, is a combination of output jack driver and sync adder. The sync signal, the composite sync from the sync generator comes in through R10 and into RV3, a voltage dividing network, and it is inverted sync because we're feeding it into the inverting input of our amplifier. Now the amplifier will re-invert it and make the pulses negative and add them at that zero volt level so that the sync pulses go zero volts down to about 0.3 volts, 0.286 is the actual spec, so anywhere around between those points is good sync and the video goes north of zero volts. So sync is negative, video is positive. Looking at this diagram, in the upper left corner I show the circuit on the sync board, sync and deflection board, that generates the 30 volt pulse used to switch the beam off and on in the monoscope tube. It's a very simple circuit. On the far left, composite blanking not. The bar over the top means that it's a not signal. Its active state is low. The composite blanking not goes through an inverter, U4B, where it is turned over so that its active state is on. This is to drive transistor Q1 on during blanking and off during active video. When Q1 turns on, the voltage on its collector will be pulled down to ground. When it is turned off, the resistor R question mark, 1.2K, 
pulls that voltage up to the adjustable B plus voltage of around 30 volts. It sits between 27 and 30 volts. It is actually the voltage of the width control so that our blanking pulse is anywhere in that region. This produces a pulse way bigger than necessary for blanking the tube. That signal is sent through J3 down to the high voltage board which is in the rest of this diagram and it comes in on J2 of the high voltage board is coupled through the 0.1 microfarad 1 kilovolt capacitor and is added to the DC voltage on the right side of R25 which is then connected to grid number one. Grid number one in the tube its job is to turn the beam on, turn it off, and the DC voltage on it sets its absolute level. And that's how we adjust our beam with the beam control. The beam control covers a range of minus 1000 volts down to minus 1050 volts, and generally it operates in the middle at one th minus 1025 volts. We'll be looking at scope waveforms in a moment. So that is essentially the circuit involved in sending blanking to the grid. Now, the cathode and the grid are where this occurs. So the cathode voltage must not change when the grid voltage is changing. If you'll note that there are two metal conductors close to each other, that's a capacitor. It's a very, very tiny capacitor, but there's enough capacitance to cause a problem. So we swamp out the capacitance of the cathode with the other 0.1 microfarad, 1 kilovolt capacitor, which takes the cathode, which is at minus 1,000 volts DC, DC. And then the capacitor connects the cathode to ground in the AC mode. So any leakage signal from the grid that is coupled to the cathode is shunted to ground through that capacitor. I just added those to the schematic which is why there's still C question mark. I haven't I haven't annotated that. So those were the two big orange capacitors that I put on the board and that repairs the blanking drive to the tube. I'll now show the waveforms and prove that that is repaired. Channel 1 of the oscilloscope is connected to the blanking signal coming from the sink generator board. This signal is 30 volts, peak, DC coupled. The upper trace at the moment is set to 0 volts. The scale is 20 volts per division. The second trace, the one on the middle line, is connected to G1 through a 100 to 1 scope probe. For a thousand volts in, the scope will see 10 volts, and I have the scope set to 50 volts per division. So two divisions is 1000 volts on the scope. So let me turn on the chief and we will see the result. We are looking at vertical scan rate. All right. On the upper trace, which I'll try to make more visible by killing the, um, I have to stand in the glare so you can see it. The upper trace is the composite blanking signal and you can see the two gaps one on the left side and one near the right side which represent the vertical retrace time. Note the squareness of this signal. Note that it is almost two divisions high at 20 volts per division. It is going from 0 volts to 37 volts or so. The bottom trace has moved down from the center line down two, over two divisions, which are 500 volts per division, 
it has moved down to 1050 volts DC. It is carrying this blanking signal at 30 volts peak to peak or 40 volts peak to peak on it, but at this scale we can't see it. You can just make out the vertical interval on it. Now, let me change the coupling on channel 2 to AC so that we can look at this signal after it has been coupled over the capacitor and sent to grid 1. Pardon the glare. I'm going to change the DC offset of the signal and we're going to turn up the gain so that we are now looking at 20 volts per division on the second trace. Yes, there is some distortion here, but that's the result of AC coupling, but there's nothing wrong with this signal as far as the tube is concerned. This signal is coupled to the grid. We know that it's sitting on a DC level of minus 1050 volts. It's 40 volts peak to peak, the same as the input signal. And the capacitors are big enough that the low frequency point, which is the vertical blanking interval, the lowest frequency, it's about a millisecond wide, I estimate. I think it's a millisecond. Um, it's a long period compared to this glow here, which is all of the horizontal blanking intervals we'll look at in a moment. And so you can see that when this is low, it's making the grid more negative and cutting off the beam. And when it's high, that's active video, active scanning. And it is 40 volts peak to peak, which is way more than enough to control the beam in any cathode ray tube. That is from full cutoff to full on or to the highest level that makes the picture look good. So, as you can see, the blanking signal is reaching grid 1 in very good form. All right, now let's go to horizontal rate. All right, these are the same signals. This is horizontal blanking here. This is about 10 or 11 microseconds wide where it cuts off the beam for horizontal retrace. And down here you can see again that the signal coupled to grid 1 sitting at minus 1050 volts is 40 volts peak to peak. It's nice and square. This is absolute proof that the signal for blanking the monoscope tube is perfectly fine. Here we're looking at the horizontal scan circuit of the chief. On the right side is the deflection coil showing both the vertical and the horizontal windings. The horizontal deflection windings are the two vertical elements of that coil. Q2 is the horizontal deflection transistor. It is driven by a pulse that is transformer coupled from a monostable multivibrator set to take the horizontal drive signal and produce a 50-50 square wave with a duration of 31.75 microseconds per high period and the same for the low period. It's 60, half of 63.5 microseconds. The monostable multivibrator switches the base of the transistor off and on. The collector of the transistor, when the transistor is switched on, pulls current down through the deflection coil from the adjustable B plus input. It's passed through a current sensing resistor, which I didn't end up using. And it when it's switched on, current flows through the deflection coil. And then when it switches off, Q2 switches off, 
there's a reverse current produced as the magnetic field on the deflection coil collapses abruptly and it is resonated with capacitor C13 and shunted away by the diode which is built into Q2. And this makes the magnetic field go backwards very quickly which is called the retrace period. Now in a moment I'll show you on the scope that that retrace period was too big to fit inside of blanking and was causing a mirror image to appear on the right side of the display. I fixed that by adding the 30K resistor shown next to the resonating capacitor. It is connected symbolically uh, to both ends of the deflection yoke. Here we see that it's connected to pin 4 of the deflection yoke. The other end, horizontal plus, is connected to pin 3 of the deflection yoke. Let's look at those waveforms now. Here we're looking at the current in the horizontal deflection coil. And note that I can move the deflection waveform left and right relative to the video output. You can see the video along the top of the video trace moving left and right. And what we want is we really want that, that S-shaped pulse right here to be centered in the blanking region which it is and that is how I got rid of the the fold back. We're looking at a current on the big pulse of about plus and minus a half an amp or more maybe even up to an amp and the diagonal long trace, the scan current, is going from plus and between plus and minus 100 milliamps to plus and minus 200 milliamps. So the scan current is low, but the retrace current is high to make the beam snap back to the other side. Here we're looking at the picture on the monitor with the resistance substitution box set to the correct amount in parallel with the deflection yoke. Let's increase the resistance now to what it used to be, which was almost infinite. We'll go up to one mega ohm. Notice that the picture is moving, and as we get to a high enough resistance, it stops moving. And when I bring it back, you can see on the one side there, on the right side, you can start to see that image coming in from the poor retrace time. So as I decrease the resistance, notice that is moving away. And at right around 33 kilo ohms, in parallel with the deflection yoke, it got rid of it there. And then if I keep decreasing, we start to see it on the right side. We start crushing the right side. So 33K turned out to be just the right amount and I installed a 33K resistor in parallel with the deflection yoke in order to fix that. Notice that we no longer see that stupid fold back on either side of our range. So that is the repair for the horizontal fold back. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you learned something, and I hope you got something out of it. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Greetings to all the old subscribers. If you guys liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. And this will help the uh, notifications process in YouTube. As much as I hate to ask for the thumbs up, that's a necessity of getting the views. And if you have friends that like this subject matter, be sure to point them at the channel, as usual. And until next time, Lab Guy out. <laughs>